Oops. <laughs> Sorry. I hope uh, I hope that you didn't have dead air for too long. Um, yeah. Uh, I got caught up in uh, pricing some um, uh, 16 millimeter cans, um, plastic cans. Uh, we're basically doing a um, rehousing of some of the uh, cans that have rusted. Uh, because when they rust, then they become airtight and then they start this horrible process of turning into acetic acid and just kind of getting worse and worse and worse and worse. So, um, anyways, we're looking to do that. Um, and it's expensive. It's not cheap. So I'm trying to find the best pricing uh, that I can. Um, and used cans, if we can help it, because those, you know, were reusing stuff that would have gotten trashed. Anyhow, uh, I'm Skip Alzheimer, and welcome to the AV Geeks Lunchtime Streaming Show, where if we're not sitting and reading price lists, we actually show you 16 millimeter films. Uh, and so uh, what we just watched was a um, home movie <laughs> visiting an oil well. <laughs> and I, I'm guessing they were on vacation, or I don't know what the deal was, but it's like, oh, look, you know, everybody's wearing ties, and it's like, yeah. Um, that's why I like home movies, because you never know when you're, where you're going to end up and what's going to happen. Uh, it's kind of fun. Uh, this next film is a Centron film, and uh, it's part of this series that's kind of open-ended, and it deals with, um, you know, it's, it's presented to someone who's in junior high or high school, and it's trying to um, show you the types of personalities that you might encounter in your fellow students. And so in the past, there was The Outsider, which is a, a girl who just doesn't feel like she fits in and it's all in her head. Um, there's the gossip, there's the bully, and this is Cheat, Joy. Why don't they call? They've had plenty of time to decide. Hello? Yes, this is John. Yes, I know why you're calling. They did. Oh, they did. No. I guess that's it then. Thanks anyway. Did you hear about John Taylor? They voted him out as student council representative because he was caught cheating. Who? John Taylor voted out John of student Taylor council cheating? representative. Who was cheating? cheating? John Taylor? John Taylor? John Taylor? John Taylor? John Taylor? You a cheat, John? John, what have you done? Remember how it all started. The day you went over to Mary's house to study for the test. Remember? All right, John, now look. The problem is to factor x squared minus 9x plus 20. Now, how do you do it? Let's see. x squared minus 9x plus 20. You take the x squared minus the 9x and... Oh, you subtract x from x squared, and then you... Oh, golly, Mary, I don't know anything about this factoring business. John, you do, too. Now, the answer is the quantity x minus 5 times the quantity x minus 4. Now, do you see how I got it? Yeah, I guess I do. But golly, Mary, this stuff's awful. I just don't get most of it. 
Well, just have to. You won't pass the test tomorrow. I know it. Mary, if I get stuck on the test, you'll help me, won't you? How can I help you? It's easy. Miss Granby hardly ever comes back to where we sit. If I get stuck, I'll just ask you for the answer. Well, I don't know. Oh, forget it. I probably won't have any trouble anyway. But you remember what happened the next day, John. Miss Granby's test was even tougher than you thought it would be. There were a lot of problems you couldn't work. And it seemed to you that you didn't stand a chance of passing the test. And right there in front of you sat your pal, Mary, with her head chock full of all the answers you needed. You thought about it. There you were, desperate. And there was your salvation within arm's reach. So you decided to take a chance. You asked Mary for help. And of course, Mary, being Mary, gave you the help. It was all so simple. You began to wonder why you'd spent so much time worrying about the test. Yes, sir, you felt pretty pleased with yourself. You'd put one over on Miss Granby. A few days later, Miss Granby returned the graded papers. Was there a shadow of doubt in Miss Granby's face as she looked at you? What was there for Miss Granby to doubt? After all, wasn't this the best grade you'd ever made on an algebra test? Maybe that was it. Maybe the grade was too good. Somehow that odd little look Miss Granby gave you seemed to haunt you. Did you really earn that 92, John? I wonder. Oh, she didn't mean anything. That test wasn't very important anyway. Yes, you thought it was just a little thing. But it was the beginning of all your trouble. After that, life went on for you pretty much as usual. You were busier than ever with sports, with Mary and your friend Jim, and most of all with your new job as student council representative. You'd always wanted to be on the student council, and you were really proud of yourself the day you were elected to take Jack Martin's place when he moved out of town. But now, with the honor of the job, went the necessity of keeping your grades up, and that was your problem. Hello? This is Jim. Let's go down to Sam's and get a hamburger. I can't, Jim. I've got homework to do. Oh, don't worry about it. You've got plenty of time. Okay, let's go get a hamburger. I'll see you in a minute. The big clock in the hall went on ticking off its even measure of time. And you went on as before. You and Mary were still the best of friends, but Mary had assumed greater importance to you. You came to depend upon her more and more in your schoolwork, although you scarcely realized it. It wasn't that Mary was any smarter than you were. It was just, well, that she seemed to find more time to study. And you were student council representative and a very busy fellow. Okay, that finishes the problems. Now how about our history? You haven't done your history lesson either? Well, gosh, Mary, I can't do everything. I have two council meetings this week. I just don't have time to study. Well, here are the answers to the history lesson. But I think you're going to have trouble when we have tests and all these things. What are you going to do about the big test tomorrow? Oh, I'll get by all right. If I have trouble, you'll help me again, won't you? And that's how it was. Gradually, Mary had become your partner, although as time went on, she seemed less willing to do your work for you. Sometimes, Mary looked at you almost as Miss Granby had. Well, so long, Mary. Thanks a lot for your help. Yes, thanks a lot for your help, Mary. Whether you intended to help him or not, it was clear John depended on you. Didn't you begin to wonder what you were letting yourself in for? Take the next day, for instance, the day of the test.
What's the answer to number nine? Shh. You gotta help me. What's the answer to number nine? John, bring it up here, please. I'm afraid I'll have to give you both zero on the test. And both of you are to report to me after school, please. So you were caught, John. You were exposed in front of the class. And what's more, Mary was involved too. Mary, who was only trying to help. And then what happened? Your classmates seemed to treat you a little coldly. Perhaps it was because they had studied and worked hard for their grades. Maybe they felt that your cheating gave you an unfair advantage. And their thoughts about you were reflected in another way. Hey, what's up? Meeting of the student council. That's funny. My name isn't on there. I'm on the student council. I don't think you'd want to come to this meeting. It's about you. Me? That's what I hear. Say, would you mind calling me after the meeting's over and let me know how it comes out? No, I wouldn't mind. No, I don't say that what John did was right, but I do think we ought to give him another chance. You mean you think we ought to let him go on being in the student council? I think we should. I don't. You've got to admit he's a good representative. That's right, but I don't think anyone that cheats should hold an office. That's right. I think we should elect a new representative. Well, don't you know, All right, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We won't get anywhere by all talking at once. Are we ready to take a vote now? All in favor of giving John another chance, hold up your hands. All who think we should elect a new student council representative, hold up your hands. Well, I guess most of us feel the same way about it. Who's going to tell John? I'll tell him. I said I'd call him when the meeting was over. I'll call him as soon as I get home. John, I guess you know why I'm calling. We had that meeting about you a little while ago. They decided to elect a new student council representative. I'm sorry, Johnny, but I guess you know why. Yes, John knew why it was. He'd been caught in a trap of his own making and had involved his friends, too. He now found himself looked down on by friends and classmates. But did John really intend to be dishonest? Should Mary share any of the blame? Was it fair for John to use Mary as he did? And what about his classmates? Did John's cheating hurt them in any way? Should they have given him another chance? What do you think? So, um, what I like about these Centron films is that they are um, open-ended, and it basically ends with, what do you think? Um, I'm trying to adjust the webcam here. Oh, that's not right. That's better. Um, yeah, and you get a lot of internal dialogue in Centron films, um, which you don't always get in the other uh, Coronet or... Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, so, uh, and of course we know John is wrong. I mean, come on. You know, he's he's trying to use his power and his sway. And just, anyways. Um, thank you, Mitch, for the coffee. Uh, one way you can record AV, uh, record, reward AV Geeks is buying us coffee. Uh, caffeine is what is the secret lubricant that drives AV Geeks. And, uh, so, um, behind me, I have a uh, telecine hooked up, and I just pulled a film that I have not seen off the shelf. And uh, so let's watch it. It's Carousel. Enjoy.
So, uh, yeah, that the uh, there's no leader at the end. Um, so that process was called solarization, and so it's not just quite doing a negative. So if you actually took that image and put it in and reversed it, it wouldn't quite look right. Um, and uh, I will tell you that when we scan things for uh, um, for filmmakers, experimental films are hard especially ones that have faded because we have no idea what the colors are supposed to be and it's like is it supposed to look like that is it negative like what you know it's it's really difficult and that reminds me of probably one of the hardest color correction jobs that i attempted and then just utterly failed there was no way to do it so it was a nasa film that was uh, a 3d film so you had to use your red and um green or bluish uh, anaglyph glasses. So there's a red and a green channel 
Um, and it was about Mars. <laughs> so then on top of that, you have the red surface of Mars. Then on top of that, the film had faded. And so I really tried to color correct it. It was, it was impossible uh, because you have to balance, you have to get the right levels with the anaglyph. And then the fact that, you know, the green had faded and it was Mars, it was just a nightmare. <laughs> it was really, really hard. Uh, speaking of NASA, uh, this is a, a film that uh, was made by NASA and it's about David. Uh, and I can't remember his last name, but David is what they based uh, the boy in the plastic bubble on. Uh, someone who had no immune system or severely limited immune system and then like how NASA helped create technology so he could go out and play. So this is David's world. July 1977, Texas Children's Hospital, Houston. A six-year-old named David, who has been confined to germ-proof isolator since birth, enters a specially built mobile isolation suit for the first time. For David's family, his physicians and nurses, it is the fulfillment of a long-held dream, a climax to years of hope and suspense. For David, it is the opening of a whole new world of sights, and sounds, and space. David has been in sterile isolation longer than any human being. His condition, called severe combined immune deficiency, is a rare genetic defect in which the body has essentially no germ-fighting abilities. Exposure to viruses and bacteria that healthy children normally cope with would be life-threatening. Yet, except for this one complication, David has been physically and emotionally sound since birth. During his infancy, hopes ran high that a bone marrow transplant would affect a cure. But by age three, the odds of finding a suitable donor had greatly diminished. With no corrective treatment in sight, David's physicians began to think seriously about mobility, a means that would allow him outside the isolator for brief periods to enhance his social and psychological development. Since space technology appeared to offer the closest parallel, consultations began with NASA's Johnson Space Center located only a few miles from the hospital. Close at hand were almost 20 years of experience in developing life support systems, experience that spanned the history of manned space flight. Although the suit built for David looks much like an astronaut spacesuit, its function is not the same. Spacesuits, by means of an oxygen-filled backpack, are designed to maintain a pressurized atmosphere for the astronaut in an environment where there is no atmosphere. David's suit is more closely related to the quarantine garments the first lunar astronauts changed into when they returned to Earth. At the time, no one really knew if the moon contained harmful bacteria and the suits were meant to protect the Earth from possible contamination. After the third lunar mission, scientists had determined that the moon was harmless and the quarantine was lifted. While these suits were designed to protect the environment and David's to protect against the environment, the common denominator, technologically, was containment of microorganisms. And it was this technology, developed for use in 1969, that years later became the basis for the system developed for David. But long before arriving at this point, the entire system had to be proven safe and reliable. 
throughout the development phase in space center shops and laboratories, materials and components were tested, analyzed, and tested again. They had to pass tough requirements every step of the way. Requirements much more severe than any they would likely ever encounter in actual use. It was a test regimen every bit as strict as for equipment destined to fly in space. But even with the best testing procedures, no one can pinpoint precisely when a component might fail. Therefore, the system was designed throughout with backup capabilities to ensure continued operation. For example, there are two batteries available to power the blower that supplies filtered air to the suit, even though only one operates at any given time. Should the operating battery fail, the system automatically switches to the other battery to avoid interruption of the air supply. In addition, the batteries can be charged by ordinary household current. Or from an automobile cigarette lighter. But it isn't likely that both batteries would fail at the same time. Should it happen, there is a completely separate blower with its own battery supply that can be connected immediately. To evaluate the system under realistic conditions, like those it would meet with in actual use, NASA had to use test subjects that would fit into the child size suit. This is five-year-old Beth Sauer, a completely healthy child who was used for most of the tests. On several occasions, Beth put the system through its paces with conditions and activities like those expected in normal operation. checkout shall be performed before each use of the MBIS. Okay, CB5 in, CB3 in, CB4 in, CB1 in, CB2 out. As this was a time for testing, it was also a time for training, with David's parents and his nurses getting a complete course in system operation. Since they would perform the actual procedures when the system was turned over to the hospital, the training regimen was exacting in every detail. The manual for operating procedures, like checklists for spaceflight, left nothing to chance. The philosophy here, as in all stages of development, came down to a well-defined goal. To make sure David would enter a germ-free suit and exit the same way. The major stop on David's first outing was a hospital classroom. Nothing out of the ordinary for most six-year-olds, but for him, it offered unique opportunities. There was clowning to do before the mirror. Playing catch with his sister. A genuine thrill when it's the first time. And it was a special treat to work in closer touch with his teacher. Although David performs above average in his schoolwork, the mobile isolator, by broadening his environment, 
will enhance his educational experiences. In the coming months, outings lasting at least four hours will take him to many places of interest. The park, the zoo, Johnson Space Center, places that will expand his awareness of the world outside. But as David begins to receive the benefits of science and technology, he is also making an important contribution. Through him, medical science has been given a rare opportunity for observation and study. Findings have already led to a better understanding of his own immune defect, and they continue to increase the knowledge of how the human body copes with disease. In another sense, David is a pioneer, the first of many patients who will utilize a system of this basic concept. NASA has already completed and shipped a similar system to Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. In the coming months, it will be evaluated on young cancer patients whose body immunity has been temporarily impaired by chemotherapy. It is for this type of patient those undergoing drug therapy for disease or organ transplant that the system will eventually have its widest use. In time, hospitals and medical centers will likely consider these or similar systems a normal part of their equipment inventory. Meanwhile, the preliminary steps have been taken. The first mobile isolation system is operating successfully. Because of it, David's world has expanded beyond the plastic walls of his isolator. It has placed within reach what promises to be a richer, more normal life experience. So people were trying to date that uh, film based on the logo, the NASA logo. And uh, I might have mentioned in the past that that logo is called the Earthworm logo. And the previous one, which uh, they had before, which was the big blue one, they called that the meatball. And I always thought they should call it the, instead of the Earthworm, they should call it the spaghetti. Um, <laughs> because there's a lot of it like Italian food related things that come up in NASA uh, or Italian, you know, Latin. But uh, yeah, I always think that's what I call the spaghetti logo. Uh, but they went back to the, the, uh, the meatball, um, I think in the nineties um, and they made it all 3d looking. So, all right. So I've got, uh, okay, we'll do this. Um, this is a great film. Uh, before long, long, long before I collected 16 millimeter films, I was collecting other things. Let's see, baseball cards, comic books, coins, uh, rocks, fossils, um, and of course, stamps. And this is a film about stamps. This is uh, Stamps, a nation's calling card. Enjoy.
The stamp we issue here today commemorates the accomplishments of the flights of Eagle and of Columbia. The stamp is an airmail stamp. It depicts mankind's John Lee, and it was made from a die which accompanied Eagle to the moon. The commemorative stamp is, in a very real way, an instrument of the American people. It is a means by which they pay homage to those events and to those men whom it honors. What started out in 1847 as prepayment certificates for delivery of mail have become our nation's calling cards, a gallery in miniature of the people, events, and ideas important to our nation. also see in stamps a textbook of changing styles of art. copies made. Commemorative stamps, the special issues, have about 120 million copies. But first, one stamp must be made, born of the minds and hands of individual artists and craftsmen. The subjects for stamps and the artists to visualize them are selected by a stamp advisory committee, experts in art, history, printing, and philately. Final selection and approval of a design 
is made by the Postmaster General. Engraving, printing, and processing are done by the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. From the actual size photographic model, the engraver starts his dies. These will be the source of the single handmade die proof and the millions or billions of copies. are developed. The moon landing stamp requires seven colors. But to compensate for depth of engraving and for the speed of presses during mass production, many samples with slight color variations are prepared. A separate die is made for each plate used on a press. Here, one die is made for the three colors to be engraved and one die for each of the four colors to be lithographed. graphic proof ready. All that's needed are the engraved colors to bring the stamp to life. crafted, precision-made miniature artwork is ready for mass production. First, multiple impression plates for the presses. To make the engraving plates, the process requires a series of hardenings in hot cyanide and transfers of impression. Transfer is performed by siderography, writing on iron. No gauges, no meters. Experience gives the operator the right feel of the wheel and the plate. For these multicolor stamps, the steel plate serves as a reproducing master. In a series of electrolytic platings, nickel-based chrome-covered press plates are produced. Each of these plates is etched by pantograph with its own plate number at each corner. All sheets printed from this plate carry this plate number. 
On the press, the plate is inked by inking rollers, one roller for each color. Each roller is cut to put its color on the proper sections of the plate and nowhere else. With each turn, the moon landing plate is inked with three colors. The plate's surface is wiped off, and the ink in the engraved lines is picked up by the paper, precisely overprinting the lithographic colors. Many stamps are printed entirely by steel engraving. Using rolls of paper instead of sheets, the press in one pass puts on the ink and dries it. Puts gum on the back and dries it. Puts an invisible phosphor coating on the front and dries it. The phosphor coating is for automatic sorting and canceling of letters. Even though only one ink is used, the engraving produces differences of shading, gives a sense of three dimensions. Perforating and cutting require precision too. For the kinds of stamps we've seen so far, a separate operation is required. There's a special press that prints as many as nine colors from engraved plates and inking rollers. It gums the back, coats the front, inspects each color and coating. It perforates the roll and cuts it into sheets. It does all this in one pass of the paper. It's the only press of its kind, anywhere. processing. The sheets are examined and counted by hand, twice. They're prepared for sale as panes or books. Some stamps wind up as coils.
In the United States each year, more than 28 billion stamps are sold. Most of them are used on mail. But stamp collectors buy enough to give the philatelic section of the Postal Service a profit every year. A stamp is a stamp is a stamp. Or is it much more? There you go. There's everything you would really ever need to know about stamps. Um, I actually have a couple of films about stamps. Um, and I've always like, yeah, I should do a show about them. <laughs> but I think that um, uh, in monitoring the comments, I see how, how things went down a different path uh, when you guys are engaged and sometimes when you kind of meander off. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I like you guys a lot. You have a, a strong community, and especially the things that you say in your comments, you are very open, and there's support there, and I very much appreciate that. Um, I feel like we've cultivated that, um, that we're supportive, and we are open mm -hmm. and kind. Um, and so, good. Thank you. Um, so we'll be back again tomorrow, one o'clock. We'll watch more films. Um, I was going to show, as you can see behind you, uh, handicrafts of uh, Belgium, but we ran out of time. So we'll watch it tomorrow. How about that? Um, if you like what you saw today, you can certainly buy us coffee um, right here at buymeacoffee.com slash avgeeks. You can also go to avgeeks.com and see other shows that we have online. And there's also an opportunity to buy DVDs there. Uh, you can hit like, subscribe, um, and of course share and tell other people about what we're doing. Uh, that's the idea. Hitting the like button or the thumbs up button actually um, gives us points so that uh, these streams will be shown to other people. If people are like, oh yeah, I like this, um, it will come up um, and we'll get more eyeballs on it, which I very much like. We'll also get people who are just uh, like, I don't know what I'm watching, and I don't think I can stand it. <laughs> so I know that that's part of it. 
Um, but everybody have a great rest of your day, and we will see you again soon. Um, as always, uh, I don't think I fixed this yet. Um, please rewind. Love each other. Uh, take care. And we will see you again tomorrow.